this morning. Amen? All right. Amen. All right. The Jam Church is on their way out, and we're on our way in. We're going to start a new series of messages today. For the next several weeks, what we're going to do is outline for you what we have in mind here at Life Church. We're going to take the summer, and we're going to basically uh, let you know what our core values are and what we're looking for. Amen? Uh, we call it Summer at Life Church, and I'm so glad that you guys came out this morning. It's a nice crowd on a Sunday morning in June. Amen? Uh, June is one of my favorite months. Uh, I like the summertime. I'm weird. I like the heat. Uh, cold weather, Jerry and I just don't get along that good. Uh, so God sends me to Illinois to live, to uh, work on that with me. But I love the summertime. I love July. July is mission month. We'll be doing some missions coming up. But in a church, churches typically go through what they call a summer slump in the summertime because people travel. And I'm one of those. I traveled last week, had a great time. Uh, actually, I was suffering for the Lord in Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg last week. Thank you for praying for me as I suffered. Amen. Um, we had like 65 grandkids with us. Uh, they were everywhere. Um, I also had a fight with the bottom of the pool. Some of you can tell. Some of you, some of you thought maybe Robin did that. No, she didn't do that. Um, just had a great time, though. You know, the Lord's so good to us, isn't he? Y'all agree with me? Is God good to you or not? He's good to me. And I, I just, uh, just want to thank him uh, for that time. Got to spend time with uh, a bunch of the kids and, and travel. Of course, at my age, it's the, the recovery time is a lot longer than it used to be. Um, well, it, gets worse. it gets worse. Thank you for your encouragement, brother. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, everyone's got uh, got to, the Bible says everyone has a word. I guess that stands word for me today. Amen. Yeah, I read it. <laughs> In Ecclesiastes, it is a word. That's true. I told him last night that that at my age now, I'm looking less at my future and more at my past. You know what I mean? Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about? I have realized I'm not a youth anymore. That big realization has hit me. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, grateful. I think that's a word that I can describe today. I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful to be here. You know what it means today? I got at least one more sermon, Jim. You know? And if I make it through the next, what am I preached? About 20 minutes? Is that what I did last night? Something like that? So if I make it through the next 20 minutes or so, then I got another one in. And, and you know, I don't, I, I don't want to take my days for granted. Young people, don't take your days for granted. Don't take your youth for granted. I know how it feels. I remember I was there a long, long time ago. It's like, I'm never going to get old. And, you know, I used to think old people. I mean, I, I lived at a time when I thought 30 was old. Man, 30 is young now. You know what I mean? I mean, you're in the prime of life, you know. Anyway, enough about that this morning. Let's, uh, let's get into the scripture together. And it looks to me like uh, I'm not connected this morning. Uh, yeah. Can you all hear me? You can hear good. I'm just going to leave it like it is. Now, for you OCD people, there is something hanging there. Uh, so try to look somewhere else and, and do that. I, I fight with these things every week. I just, uh, I don't know. I've got a great idea for you today. The message is called, We Are Grace People. You'll notice that. During the summertime, we've kind of scaled things back a little bit because we're kind of resetting here at Life Church. When I came here 12 years ago, the church went through a reset. And we started with a couple dozen people and began to work. And over the last 12 years, I know we've baptized well over 200 people. I know that. We've planted three churches that I know of, one of which is going very, very well in McKenzie, Tennessee with Pastor Ryan. And we've just seen God really work in such great ways. But in any organization, you have times when you have to kind of pull back and look at what you're doing and figure out what's working and what's not working. And what we're trying to do during this summer is we're trying to put out to the people that come what we are all about and what we're going to be doing. And today is going to be one of our core values that you're going to hear us say a lot. 
It's the idea that we are grace people. Now, how many of you have heard of the word grace? Okay. Amen. I mean, uh, we sing a song sometimes called what? Amazing Grace. And uh, the guy that wrote that was, was a man who was a very, very, he was a very wicked man, a uh, slave trader. Uh, just about as far down on the list as you can get as far as character is concerned. But he got saved by God's grace. God's grace just tracked him down. And ladies and gentlemen, if anybody ever comes to salvation in Jesus, they will do it through God's grace, and that is it. There's no other way to get to God. And if you are saved today, it's because God has shown his grace to you. And if God has shown his grace to you, then it just makes sense that we ought to be people of grace. If God has given you grace, then it makes sense to me that we give people grace. And that's what we want to be here. We want to be people here that live according to God's grace. And one of the best places to get this message is from Titus chapter 2. So if you'll take out your outlines, we'll read the scripture together. And we'll go through these thoughts today as we put down the idea uh, that we are grace people. Notice what Paul wrote. The apostle Paul wrote this letter to a young leader. His name is Titus. And he says this. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave his life. How many of you believe he gave his life for us? No one took the life of the Lord Jesus. He gave his life. And he gave his life with a purpose. It wasn't in order that you and I could just seek out after our own sinful lives. No. He gave his life, according to the scripture, to free us from every kind of sin. Say free. free. He, he gave his life in order that you and me might be free. And then he, he also says to cleanse us, say cleanse, yeah. and to make us his very own people. Notice this last phrase. Take a look at it. Totally committed to doing good deeds. That sounds like grace people to me. Doesn't it you? Doesn't that sound like what God did? You see, the gospel is all in these scriptures, and everything in the gospel is attached to the idea of grace. Now, I'm going to do my best to explain grace to you. And if you're willing to hear the word of God today, God will be good and gracious to you, and you will be able to be one of his today. Point number one is this. Grace is God's heart. When you think about God, God is awesome. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is omnipresent. He's present everywhere. You can't get away from him. But when we think about the heart of God, the first thing that comes to mind is the idea of being a God of grace. It is God Almighty's heart. And you know, if you're God, you can be any kind of God you want to be. The thing about it is that everyone in this room, if we took a vote and said we're going to vote on what type of God he's going to be, it just wouldn't matter one iota because God is just simply who he is. And if our God was like the Muslim God, which was aloof and not there and just somewhere else and you could never please him, that would be a bad day. But our God is not like that God. Our God is a God of grace. Our God is a God that sees us where we are and loves us where we are and loves us like we are. And he loves us so much that he can actually change who we are. He's a God of grace. The Bible says the grace of God has been revealed. When Jesus Christ came to the earth, guess what? God's grace was revealed. Think about it. What in the Godhead did God need so much that he was willing to become one of us? He didn't need any of that. What he did, though, is he wanted to be with us. When Jesus was born, the Bible said that they called his name Emmanuel, 
which means God with us. And so God reveals his grace in the birth of Jesus. God reveals his grace in the life of Jesus because Jesus did what none of us in this room can do. He overcame sin. He overcame the enemy. He overcame death. Jesus Christ is the one that can do what we cannot do. And God's grace was revealed through his life. God's grace was revealed through his death. Because when he died, he took the punishment that he did not deserve. He took the punishment that you and I did deserve. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we in our world and in our lives are not very graceful people. Amen? You know why? Uh, sometimes we say it like this. Well, that's just not right. And we say the way someone treated me was just not right. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't want what is right to come to you. Think about it. If you got what you deserved, it wouldn't be something you liked very much. But God didn't give us what we deserve. Jesus Christ revealed God's heart and God's grace because the punishment that I deserve, he took. And he took it. And he took it to the grave. And God's grace was revealed through his death. And God's grace was revealed through his resurrection. God's grace was revealed because when he ascended into heaven, he ascended to show that he is king of kings and lord of lords. And at the name of Jesus, everyone will bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And then Jesus sent to us his spirit. God's grace has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Now, what does the word salvation mean? We talk about it a lot, right? Right? There's a song that I hear now called, I Got Saved. Y'all know what that means? Is anybody saved in the room? Do you have any idea what that means? What does salvation mean? You see, salvation is not, I got to get my act together. Salvation is not, there's some rules I got to keep and try to, and try to make it work better. Salvation is not, I got to put on a good front. Let me tell you the pictures of salvation from the Bible. It is forgiveness of sins. It is a new birth. Salvation is a new life. Salvation is a new identity, a new hope, a new beginning, a new holiness, a new family. Salvation means something has been rescued and changed. Look at the scripture from Romans chapter number 6. The Bible says this very clear. He says, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. So we too might walk in what? Newness of life. When someone is saved, there's a new thing that happens in their heart. And that's what the grace of God brings. God's grace has been revealed and he brings salvation. So here's the point today. People. Saved by grace become grace people. You're never the same. If you have been saved, you're not the same. If you are the same, you haven't been saved. One of the things that Life Church wants to do, our mission statement, our vision statement, goes like this. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, we will be a growing church that transforms lives around the world starting at home. You know what that means? We want to preach the gospel so that people will be saved, will be transformed, will be different. Saved means we're delivered. Saved means we are rescued. It just begs the question, if you're still in chains, if you're still in bondage, are you really saved? The word grace means undeserved kindness. And when we receive the undeserved kindness, we have been freed from our past. We've been delivered from the power of our sin. And we don't have to live under the threat of judgment anymore. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who are saved are saved from the judgment of our sin. 
So if you're still living under judgment, have you really received grace? Grace is God's positive action toward us. So if you are a negative person, can you still say that you're a grace person? Can you be a grace person and have a negative disposition? Ladies and gentlemen, grace people are different. Grace people do not criticize and judge others because we know that we have not been judged. Grace people are not negative people because we have been given something very positive. It's impossible to be saved, rescued, delivered, and live the same way. Grace is God's heart. Point number two, grace is how we live. Grace gives us the means to live. Now, the truth about our lives is this. Our lives are about choices. You make choices every day. The problem is, too many times we make bad choices. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody like, you know, I wish I could go back and change that choice. I know I've been there. I, I, I mean, you know, some of those things that look so good, at the moment, turned out to be not so good. Grace is the power to say yes to the right things and to say no to the wrong things. God's grace gives us the sense to know which is which. And in the scripture we read this morning, the apostle tells us of the things that grace people can say no to and the things that we say yes to. So I'm asking you saved people today. Many of you said, yes, I am saved. Many of you are still thinking about it. I'm going to ask you today, do you say no to the right things? Do you say yes to the wrong things? Look at what the scripture says. Now see, I'm just going to be honest with you. I just believe the scripture is correct. Now, that might not be in everybody's value system, but it's what I know to be true. The scripture never lies. And when the scripture says this is how it is, this is how it is. So, Paul, what did you tell us today? First, we live because we say no to godless living. Did you notice that in the scripture text? We say no to godless living. What is godless living? Godless living is where we say that we will have no authority over us. We will live our life unrestricted by boundaries. And the sole morality for what we do in our lives will be determined by us. In other words, what I'm going to do is what I want to do. And it doesn't matter what any authority figure tells me. That is godless living. The truth is, all godless living has at its heart a god that is really the God of the self, which is really not a God at all. You see, you, you will serve the God who is, or you will serve the little God of the self. And when grace comes into someone's life, we have the power to say no to godless living. The Bible says in, in Psalm 14, 1, only fools say in their hearts, there is no God. You might say, well, I believe there's a God. The truth is, what you say needs to match what you do. If you live as if there is no God, you may as well say there's no God. And the Bible says that's foolish behavior. And says they are corrupt and their actions are evil and not one of them does good. Man, that's hard, isn't it? You see, this is not a thing about everyone do their own thing. Godless living is simply that. And the more our culture goes towards godless living, the more corrupt our culture gets. Truth is, godless living is death. You got that? Y'all realize that sin brings death? Does anybody know that today? You can say yes or you know what I mean? I mean, it's okay to talk back a little bit, all right? Godless living is death, but grace people are alive. You see, if you live in a godless way, you're living in death. But if you live unto God, you have been made alive, and you can say no to godless living. 
Second thing we say no to is we say no to sinful pleasures. Sinful pleasures. Does anybody have a, do I have to explain what that is? Shake your head this way or this way, okay? Do I have to explain to you this morning what sinful pleasures are? Sinful pleasures are the things that the enemy tempts you with on a regular basis. I can point to anyone in the room and tell you everyone in the room is tempted. And the Bible says we're all tempted when we're drawn away from our own desires. Desire for what? For sinful pleasures. Pleasures that God says no. Now, most people like having a good time, and I enjoy having a good time. But there are some pleasures that God says are sinful, and therefore, at the end of that pleasure is something called death. The flesh desires sinful pleasures, but the Spirit says no. Can I ask you today? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever just wanted something and the Spirit of God said no? And you had the ability to say no to something you really wanted? Listen, just because you want it doesn't mean it's right. Just because it feels good at the moment doesn't mean it's the right plan of action. In fact, if I can tell you this, particularly some of you younger folks, if you can get this in your head right now, understand something. Your feelings can lie to you. Your feelings can lead you down to the road of destruction that you can never imagine could happen. I've just seen way too many families broke up. I've seen way too many marriages been together for years and years and years. And all of a sudden, some kind of thing came in. And the next thing you know, they're heading down the road to destruction. I'm so tired of that in our culture. Young people, when you get married, get married for the right reasons. Get married to do it. Get married to stay there. Amen? You might say, oh, well, you know... There's, there's something better out there. There's nothing better. There's only flawed people. Let me tell you, that Mr. Wonderful you're about to marry is a flawed guy. That Mrs. Person that you think has never done anything wrong, she has. And everybody you will ever meet in your life is flawed. But when we have grace in our life, we have the ability to say no to sinful pleasures. We have the ability to overcome things. And we have the ability to live out the life that God has called us to live. Proverbs 10, 23 says this. Doing wrong is fun for a fool. But living wisely brings pleasure to the sensible. Wow. You see, sometimes living for Christ gets the... There's the attitude that if you live for Christ, you live a very dull life. Not according to the scripture. If you are a Christian and living a dull life... You're missing the best part of it. 1 Timothy 5, 6 says this. She who gives herself to wanted pleasure is dead even while she lives. 1 Peter 2, 24 says. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. Do you see that? You see, you live for pleasure, you're dead. You live unto God. The Bible says... You can be dead to sin. You know what that means? Sin doesn't have any power over you. You don't have to do wrong. You don't have to live in those chains. You can say no to those things. Look what Paul said in Romans 6, 11. You should also consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. We have the power to say no to the destructive in order to say yes to the better. And I want to say to you today that the Bible declares that being with Jesus is far better. It's far better than anything this world can provide. We say no to godless living. We can say no to sinful pleasures. We can say yes to the right stuff. We can say yes to wisdom. The Bible says in, in Proverbs 8.11, wisdom is more precious than rubies. And nothing you desire can compare with her. Do you hear what the scripture says? Think about what you want in your life. Think about what's important in your life. There is nothing that can compare to wisdom. Nothing you can seek that's better than wisdom. And the Bible says that we can say yes to living in wisdom. Not only can we say yes to wisdom, but we can say yes to righteousness. What is righteousness anyway? What kind of a word is that? Well, there's the word called right in there. Let me ask you something. How many of you hate being wrong? How many of you really don't even admit when you're wrong? I mean, we struggle with that, don't we? 
So the idea of righteousness is that we live right. I want to tell you, there's a peace that comes with being right. There is a joy that comes with, with being right. Because when you're wrong, you're just wrong. And if you're living wrong, you're just living wrong. And if you're living wrong, you're going to get the wrong stuff. Oh, there's a lot of people that I work with in my ministry that thinks that they can live the wrong way and it turned out right. 100% of the time, that doesn't work. Never. No one has ever sinned successfully. And you won't be the first. You won't be the first one that gets away with it and gets it done. Righteousness is so powerful. Look at Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. Do y'all believe the word? Righteousness can exalt an entire nation. What do you think it will do for you? We have the power to say yes to righteousness. And then last, we have the power to say yes to devotion to God. We have the right to say yes to devotion to God. You know what I decided to do this morning? When I came into the church service today, I had the right to say yes to worship. I decided I wasn't going to just spectate today. I was going to enter in. And when we were singing the Revelation song, I just kind of pulled myself out and pulled myself in before the presence of God and just spent some time with the Lord. Just heard you guys singing, and it was just, it was one of those, the greatest experiences that you can know. See, worshiping God, spending time in God's presence, is far, far better than anything else you can desire. I'm a musician. I like music. Y'all like music? I like music. And from my day, we played it loud. My first band, when I was in high school, if you would describe my first band, it would be described in one word, loud. We weren't even good. <laughs> but we were loud. And in our heads, we were great. You know what I mean? And uh, over the years, I learned to play a little bit, learned a little bit about the volume control, turn it down a little bit so people can understand what you're doing. I did learn some of that. And I like music. Now, Tim and I had coffee yesterday, which is a godly activity. Amen? This guy up here is going like this. Would you guys pray that Dustin would get that right someday, you know? But anyway, we're having coffee, and, and we're in the, all right, we're in the Dunkin' Donuts place, all right? But I promise I didn't do it. I, re I really didn't. I just had coffee. But they're playing music over the speakers, all right? And it's music from today, Jerry. You ever heard? It's electric something. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's electric or not. I don't know what it is. But... We listened to about 20 songs because we stayed there a long while. We were praying and fasting and, and seeking the Lord. And I'm telling you, every song had the same chord pattern. Every song had the same beat. It's like one song with 20 different titles. And I'm like, I don't, I don't even understand it. Now, young people, if you like it, that's fine. I, don't, I mean, I'm not trying to criticize you or anything. I'm just, for me, I'm just an old guy. You know, give me Sweet Home Alabama, I can play. You know what I mean? <laughs> Some of you young people, what, what, is, what is that? You know? And I like that music. I mean, I play that music. I can still do it. I can get the guitar right now. I can play that stuff all day long. I play Leonard Skinner all afternoon long and like it. But I want to tell you something. It is nothing. Like hearing somebody sing, cry out to Jesus. Because when you get into the presence of God, it is so much better. You see, I enjoy the mountains, and I enjoy swimming, and I enjoy ball games, and I enjoy music. But there is nothing that moves my soul and my spirit like being where people are singing to the most high God and his presence comes in and he reminds me that I'm his child and I belong to him. That motivates me and I'd rather worship any day. The Bible says in Psalm 1611, I'd encourage you to read Psalm 16. He says, you, made known, you make known to me the path of life. 
You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Ladies and gentlemen, serving the Lord and being in the presence of God is the right place to be. It's the right area. It's the right type of living. And grace people can live and say yes to devotion to God. See, the truth is this. Grace people are changed by the grace of God. We're changed by God's grace. If your experience with God hasn't changed you, then you have no experience with God. Paul said he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people. We're different. Point number three, grace gives us real hope. We have hope based on facts. We have hope that is not wishful thinking. We have hope that's based on the truth. The Bible says in Titus 2.13, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have received the grace of God, you have hope for the future. Look around at the world we live in now. And you take Jesus Christ and the church and the Holy Spirit of God out of the picture and there is no hope whatsoever. But all you got to do is think about the fact is that there is a Jesus who is alive from the dead. And he's at the right hand of God the Father. And he's just waiting on the moment when the Father says, go. Just as sure as he came the first time, he is coming again. We have got a future today. Ladies and gentlemen, grace people have a great present and a better future. As good as life is now. And I want to tell you, life is full of struggles, life is full of difficulties, but life is good because God is in my life. And as good as it is now, it's only going to get better. If you're living for sinful pleasures, it is as good now as it will ever be. We have hope, and it's real. And then finally, point number four, grace is our mission. Grace is our mission. We've received grace by faith and that grace commissions us. Grace is our motivator. Ladies and gentlemen, grace people reach out to others with grace. When you have received the undeserved kindness of God, that will motivate you to reach out to others with the undeserved kindness of God. Grace people are not judgmental. Grace people are not negative. Grace people are not slanderers. Grace people are people who see others as people who are messed up. But there's a God who's bigger than their mess ups. Grace people don't look down upon people because they struggle. Grace people look at people as people created in the image of God. And as people for whom Jesus Christ died. And Jesus Christ gives his spirit and his church and his word in order to free us. The Bible says he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin. I don't care what your problem is today. The power of Jesus Christ's death can free you of that sin. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how dirty your life has gotten. The power of Jesus Christ can cleanse you. And I don't care what you think about yourself and if the world has rejected you and the devil says you have no value. Jesus Christ came in order that you might be his very own sons and daughters. Totally committed to doing good deeds. Grace is our motivator. I'm saved, but I don't want to do anything in the kingdom of God. Not so. Because grace motivates us. And his own people are totally committed to doing the good things. We're grace people. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus. We've been declared not guilty. We've been given a new life. We've been given another chance, a second chance to live. Our chains have gone. We've been set free. Our God, our Savior has rescued us. We can sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. 
We have been given the gifts of the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the Church of God. We share the gospel here and around the world in this language, in other languages. We coach people to trust Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, grace people can move mountains, walk on water, cast out demons, pray for the sick and see them recover. We have been called to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every person. We witness people repenting and changing and growing and discipling. We can see captives set free, chains broken, new creatures born. We are forgiven of our past, encouraged in our present, and hopeful in our future. We are unstoppable, invincible, overcomers through him who overcame death. You can't shut us down. You can't kill us off. You can't keep us quiet. You can't even get in our way because we can go through any obstacle. We can face any peril, overcome any challenge, defeat any foe, and face down anything that raises its head against us. We are grace people. We live today. We live tomorrow. We will live forever and someday we will rule and reign with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ upon his return. We are grace people. We're the church, the redeemed, the empowered, the commissioned, the army of God, the hope of this world and the receivers of an eternal kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Life Church. Let me ask you, are you with us? We're in the business of giving out the grace that we have received. Now, if you've not received that grace today, today is your day to receive God's grace. If you've never been rescued and delivered from sin, you've never been cleansed from sin, today is your day. You don't have to get better you trust Jesus, he'll make you better. That's the best deal I've ever heard of anywhere. Jesus Christ does it all. We just offer ourselves to him and he cleanses us. Who needs to be cleansed?